Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the first ever series on YouTube aiming to cover the reign of each and every pharaoh chronologically and in depth. But today we're not going to focus on a single pharaoh. Instead, we're going to explore what was going on in Egypt right before its unification and the rise of the man who completed it, the first dynastic king of Egypt, Narmer. So in essence, this will be a prologue for the video on his reign, which I expect to release soon. In the 4th millennium BC, during cultural phases known as Nakata 1, 2, and 3, Egypt underwent a dramatic transformation as society became more stratified and local elite classes started popping up all over the place. Their members now inherited their status instead of earning it. As a result of this, people slash the plebs started specializing in trades other than farming in order to create prestige objects for the new local elites, who had more crops at their disposal than was necessary for just subsistence. Metalworking, advanced ceramic technology, and let's not forget these snazzy stone-made vases came about all because of this. Important early centers of kingship also emerged in Upper Egypt, the southern half of the country. Their elites displayed some features of dynastic Egyptian kingship, and this is where dynastic Egypt's royal iconography was born. All of these pre-dynastic centers featured a large settlement, extensive cemeteries, and a concentration of elite burials. They all vied for supremacy, but only one would eventually come out on top and unify Egypt under their kings. They include, in no particular order, Nakata, which was originally known as Nupt, meaning City of Gold. It lay near the Wadi Hammamat, a dry valley in the desert east of the Nile, which will remain important throughout the dynastic period and afterwards. As suggested by Nupt's name, its prosperity probably came from the gold in the Wadi Hammamat, and it likely controlled a territory of some size for a time. Nupt and its ruling family also played an important role in the formation of the Egyptian state, as demonstrated by the monumental tomb of Narmer's queen being here. There was also Nekin, later known as Heracompolis, which was a bit south of Nupt. Like Nupt, it had access to the eastern desert's mineral resources, but also possibly trade routes connecting Egypt with sub-Saharan Africa. It was also an incredibly important religious center and featured the cult center of the god Horus, who was very, and I mean very, important to Egypt's first rulers. And Narmer left some of the most important clues to his activities here, including the famous Narmer Palette. It also featured the world's first ever zoo. I'm not kidding. Maybe I'll make a video about it some other time. In addition, there was Kustul in Lower Nubia. It's provided a ton of very early examples of royal iconography, including the earliest depiction of the White Crown, and its rulers may have controlled all of Lower Nubia in the Nakata III period before their kingdom collapsed at the beginning of the First Dynasty. Last but certainly not least, there was Thinis, originally known as Tijeni. We know it was a bit north of Nupt, but it actually hasn't been discovered yet, and what's left of it is likely still lying under the modern town of Gerga. But the necropolis of its rulers at Abydos, or more specifically, a part of it known as the Umel Kaab, is one of our most important sources of info on this period by far, and you're going to be hearing a lot about it in due time. So now that you know about all these places, let's look at what happened between them as well as what was going on in Lower Egypt, and how that all culminated in the unification of Egypt and, as such, the creation of the world's first nation-state. During the late Nakata II period, which lasted from around 3400 BC to 3200 BC, Upper Egyptian-style pottery started appearing in Lower Egypt, and gradually replaced Lower Egyptian styles of pottery. This accompanied other socio-economic developments, like the appearance of mudbrick architecture there, and the emergence of elites there, which, of course, fundamentally changed Lower Egyptian society. This may suggest that Upper Egyptian culture or people replaced Lower Egypt's, but that's not for sure. But regardless, by the Nakata III period, both halves of Egypt were united culturally and had the same social structure, but weren't completely united politically yet. Nupt, Nakata, and Thinis were the most powerful centers in Upper Egypt by the end of the Nakata II period, but early in the Nakata III period, Nupt was absorbed 
by either Necken or Thinnis. No one really knows which. Around this time, one of Thinnis' rulers, maybe named Scorpion, so literally the Scorpion King The Rock played in that one movie, was buried in the Umel Kab in a tomb referred to as Tomb UJ. Although it pales in comparison to later dynastic royal tombs, this was the largest tomb of its period by far. It contained a whopping 400 vessels from the Levant, from as far north as Lebanon. These vessels were found with dozens of inscribed bone labels, which form the earliest corpus of writing yet found in all of Egypt. This demonstrates that writing came about in Egypt because of an obsession such Upper Egyptian rulers had with the detailed management of their economic resources. These labels mention places where commodities taken to the royal court at Thinnis had come from, including towns in Lower Egypt, which the occupant of Tomb UJ may have exercised control over. He was also buried with an ivory shepherd's crook, an unambiguous symbol of kingship which would endure throughout the dynastic period. Look, here it is with Tutankhamun. Taken together, Tomb UJ's occupant may have ruled all of the northern Nile Valley. There is also a neat graffito depicting Scorpion defeating a rival city or ruler written with a bull's head over a standard, which might refer to Nupt or its ruler. As such, by Scorpion's time, the creation of a unified Egypt may have been well underway and possibly even finished, although I personally don't think so. Nekin and Thinus may have continued to compete with each other right up to the completion of the unification of Egypt, and Nekin may have controlled the southernmost portion of Upper Egypt until that point, but ultimately, Thinus came out on top, and the Thinite line of kings would produce Narmer, the man who finished the unification of Egypt. As such, the ruler who was interred and Tomb UJ was likely one of Narmer's direct predecessors. We also know of at least two other immediate predecessors of Narmer. The first of these was the king buried in the twin chambers B1 and B2 at Cemetery B in the Umel Kab, and are a part of the same sequence of tombs as Scorpion in Tomb UJ and the pharaohs of the first dynasty who would arise from the Thinite line of kings. It's also structurally similar to Narmer's tomb. The person who was buried in this tomb had a name consisting of a falcon over top a mouth sign, which has been read as Eerie Whore, but oddly enough it wasn't placed within a Sarek. This has raised doubts over whether he was a king at all, but to me it seems he was, given that his name has been found at several sites other than Abydos, including sites in Lower Egypt like Zawiyat el Aryan near modern Cairo and at Tel el Farqa in the Eastern Delta. He's also named on a rock inscription in South Sinai, featuring the earliest known reference to the city of Memphis, which would go on to become Egypt's capital on and off for thousands of years during the dynastic period. Amazingly, Irihor's name has also possibly been found at the site of Tel Lod, which is in Israel. Amazingly far north, eh? The tomb between Irihor's tomb and Normer's tomb, which is also made up of two twin chambers, called B7 and B9, likely belongs to Normer's immediate predecessor. He was the first of the Thinite line of kings to have his name contained within a Serac. It consists of a pair of arms which has been read as Ka, since that's what we know it meant later in Egyptian history. Besides Abydos, Ka's Serac has been discovered at a number of sites, including Tel Lod in Israel, Tel Ibrahim Awad in the northeastern delta, and Kafir Hassan Daoud in the eastern delta. In addition, Ka's Serac has also been discovered on jars from two graves in the necropolis of Hel Wan. Hel Wan would become one of Memphis's two primary cemeteries, the other being North Saqqara, and the presence of Ka's name there likely confirms that Memphis Memphis existed in his time, and cylinder ceilings bearing empty Serex from before Ka's time have also been found at Helwan, which may suggest that administrative functions were being performed at Memphis even before Ka's time. It is possible that Helwan was originally just a provincial cemetery before being taken over by Memphis, however, but recent soundings by the EES's survey of Memphis also indicate Memphis was around in the late pre-dynastic period. The reason I'm mentioning all this is that later Egyptian tradition held that the first proper dynastic king of Egypt, who they refer to as Menes, who is almost certainly equivalent to Narmer, founded Memphis. Herodotus even said that Menes diverted the Nile River in order to found it. But since there is evidence to suggest that Memphis existed prior to Narmer's reign, and it's thought that high officials only started being buried near Memphis during the reign of Narmer's successor Aha, some scholars have argued that Narmer couldn't have been Menes. 
I'll outline why that probably isn't the case at the end of my next video on Narmer. I believe that Narmer was probably the first king to reside in Memphis, leading to that later tradition. But Menes' biggest accomplishment was the unification of Egypt. The unification of Egypt was so important that Menes' association with it was the main reason he was considered Egypt's first historical king. It isn't known when exactly a single king began ruling all of Egypt proper for the first time, though. Jars of Eri Hor and Ka from Abydos, inscribed with the labels Taxes from Lower Egypt and Taxes from Upper Egypt may indicate that they had politically unified the country before Narmer, but that still doesn't mean they controlled all of Lower Egypt yet. However, they did control enough of it to make distinguishing the two halves of the country useful in recording taxes. I mean, isn't it crazy that taxes go this far back? I mean, I guess it's true. The only constants in life are death and taxes. Anyways, Irihor and Ka seem to have exercised control over most of Upper Egypt besides Neken's domain, as well as the Eastern Delta, but they still likely had to compete against ephemeral kings in Lower Egypt, like the so-called Horus Crocodile, attested from Serex of his found at the site of Tarkan. Although it could have been one of the kings succeeding Uje and preceding Narmer, I believe it was Narmer who completed the unification of Egypt and that he was likely the first king to exercise authority throughout the country unchallenged. If you want to hear more about Narmer's monumental accomplishment, stay tuned for my next video on Narmer.